Welcome to the first talk of 2012. This is the Maui Institute for Astronomy, and I'm Dr. J.D. Armstrong. I'm the one that uh, puts these talks together and hopefully brings in brilliant speakers like I have this month. Uh, we're actually going to have two speakers, uh, Becky Sidney from the Maui Astronomy Club. I got it right for a change. I've, I'm often miss pronouncing that. And then uh, Steve McGee will uh, speak later. I'll give a brief introduction to Steve when we switch over. Um, both of them wanted to me, go, me to go with a very short introduction. And so Becky is, she's sort of self-taught. She's had a lot of informal education in astronomy, uh, though she's very knowledgeable and well-respected. She started the Maui Astronomy Club uh, 20 years ago. And uh, it's been going very strong ever since then. Uh, if you want to sign up, please go ahead and do so in, uh, outside. Or if you are uh, not here tonight and would like to join the Maui Astronomy Club, you can send an email to me, and I will be more than happy to put you in touch with Becky. So let's give her a big hand. <laughs> and Favorite. Oh, I love it. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I better not walk off the microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I have to put this on now. Yes. Can you hear me okay, Steph? All right, great. Hi, everybody. Welcome to AA. <laughs> no. There's coffee, donuts, and a little bit of honesty. No. <laughs> Uh, my name is Becky, and I'm president of the Maui Astronomy Club. Uh, it started 20 years ago uh, with 12 members. Now we're up to like 362. So hopefully some of you will join tonight. It's, we do something every month, really fun. Uh, we just had our gathering last weekend at La Perouse, and we have some people who were here. Yeah, wasn't it awesome? It was so awesome. Yeah, you were here. Oh, yay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So we have a lot of fun wherever we go. Um, I just want to talk tonight about amateur astronomy. We, we know what it is, right? We know it's the love of the stars. I want to show you this picture here. This is what it's all about, right? <laughs> this is what we, we love to learn. We want to know the stars, the constellations, the planets, other star systems, black holes, supernovas, galaxies. Every point of light in this picture is a galaxy. So each point is over 200 billion stars. So this is something that amateur astronomers, this turns us on, learning about this. And the Hubble has really just changed astronomy for the better. It's like opened everybody's eyes to a different universe. You know, the bigger the scopes, the bigger the universe. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're getting bigger scopes every year. I, I think the Big Island is going to be getting a big one, a 30-meter telescope. So just imagine how big the universe will be then. <laughs> it's great. So amateur astronomy is the love of the universe. And I gave a talk last year about amateur astronomy and we talked about a spectrum because there's those who just want to learn the stars and learn how to identify planets. And then there's those who discover asteroids and comets. And then there's those who buy a scope and they use it, use it occasionally. And then there's guys like Steve who use it constantly and they're constantly observing thousands and thousands and thousands of objects, you know. Okay, hundreds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, 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 look how many objects that uh, can be viewed. And then there's those like me. I take my little iPhone, you know, and I put it up to my eyepiece and my scope. I snap wonderful photos of the sun and the moon. And, but it's simple, you know. And then there's those who really get into astrophotography. And they submit images to magazines and on the Internet, like amateurs that are... are astrophotographers. So there's a broad spectrum. So you can find what you like and just keep learning. It's like a tree. You know, there's so many branches of astronomy and it's a huge umbrella. So you want to find what you like and just keep learning. You'll never learn it all. You, it, you could have 10 lifetimes uh, to learn all that there is in astronomy. Tonight I'm going to talk about, I've been doing astronomy for 20 years, so I've had a lot of opportunities present themselves to me, and these things are still available on Maui. So if you guys want to get involved into some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, it's still available here. So you can look into it. If you want to ask me questions later, great, but definitely, definitely pursue these things. It's, it'll really expand your knowledge.
And that's what it's all about. All right, let's see what the next... Okay, 23 years ago when I moved to Maui, I saw the sky for the first time. You know, that black ink sky with the stars that look like diamonds and, and you just can't stop looking and it's like, <gasps> takes your breath away. That, that's when I saw the sky and it was really like that over there. See on the right there, that excellent dark sky sight. But over the years, with light pollution, you, you can really see, like this is Kahului now. <laughs> it used to be like that. Um, but it's really changed over the years. So back when I started, we had really rich skies. Wailea didn't even exist. You know, Kihei was so small. And it, it was just incredible, incredible. But it's still beautiful sky here. We are the capital of astronomy. Hawaii is the capital. We have the world's largest scope, most sophisticated. We have the coolest people. <laughs> we have 300 clear nights a year. So, you know, not too many places on the planet can say that. So this is, just to give you an idea, uh, some of the obstacles that amateur astronomers deal with. Light pollution, you have to find a dark spot. I highly recommend La Perouse. I just started going there last year. It's one of my favorite. It is so wonderful there. It's so beautiful. Haleakala is the best. I found other spots too, like, like past Honolulu Bay out there, if you're willing to go out there. But uh, yeah, so astronomy has definitely, it's, has its challenges. Um, when I first moved here, I, I, when I saw the sky, hi, come on in, there's a front row seat right here for you. <laughs> I uh, really wanted to learn the sky, and it's like the stars were aligned. I always say that when something magical happens. My first job um, was at the Hyatt Regency. How many people here have ever been to the Hyatt Regency Tour of the Stars show? Oh, you have? Great. All right, a few people have been there. The Hyatt Regency has a rooftop observatory with huge telescopes, binoculars, computers, monitors, posters, glow. It's a cool setup. Outside on the rooftop, they take guests up three shows a night at 8, 9, or 10, and they point out the constellations and stars, and it's just fantastic. And here I am, my first job, and wow, I met the astronomer. Um, every night she would come and drop her bank in my office. I was a cashier manager at the time. So all the astronomers would drop their, their bank, and I would pick their brains. What is that star, that red star that's over in that V-shaped pattern? And I, so I learned a few of the stars and constellations, and Gigi, she was the director uh, at the time, she befriended me because she saw I was genuinely interested. So she would teach me more, and it, it was just so wonderful talking to her. About six months later, she comes up to me and says, Becky, my husband just got transferred to California for work, so we're going to be moving in a month, and I think you should tr try to apply for this position. And I'm like, what? I only know like two constellations. I I I'm not even an amateur astronomer at this point, right? I, I just know a few stars. She says, you're great with people. I, I can teach you. I'll, I'll show you how to use the instruments, and I'll show you how to prepare for the weeks to come. You know, just study up. You can just study as you go. You know, you'll learn. I'm like, okay. <laughs> she made it sound so easy. Oh my gosh, I just I dove into an ocean of just. It was a void. I I was so overwhelmed. Uh, I could not believe. Like I I just lightly jumped into this huge science, you know. It's, it's a huge science to know. People would ask me questions, of course, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, but I encouraged people. I said, please ask questions because I'm beginning in astronomy, and I want to learn through your questions. And I would, you know, back then, folks, we didn't have cell phones and computers and Internet. I mean, people had computers. I had two friends with computers. It wasn't prevalent. And the library, that's all that we had. We had no borders, no Barnes and Noble, you know. You had the library, you had your house phone, and the Maui Bulletin. That's what we had that long ago. So, uh, um, uh, where was I? Uh, oh, oh, back to the Tour of the Stars. So I'm, I, I get the job doing Tour of the Stars, and I, I had to study for like eight hours a day, and then I would work at night study eight hours and work at night. And I still wasn't even scratching the surface after six months. I'm like, oh my God, can I do this? And I just kept studying and studying and studying. And that's what it takes. Uh, then uh, after a while, I was like, wow, this is so great. You know, I need to share this with other people on Maui. 
because I didn't really have friends who were into astronomy, but I wanted to, you know, have other people to hang out with and use telescopes, share our information, everything. So I, I put a little ad in the Maui Bulletin. If you'd like to join the Maui Astronomy Club, call Becky. So that's when we got our first 12 members for the club. And it was, it was great. It was great. We did, we saw Hale Bop. You guys remember Hale Bop, the comet? We did a 5 a.m., uh, you know, event that time. And we just had a lot of fun. Um, and then I had more time during the day, so I decided to go back to school. So I went to MCC. And let's see if I have a picture. I met this guy. Do you guys know him? John Pye. This is John Pye. So if you want something great to do, besides going to Tour of the Stars, everybody should try Tour of the Stars. It's a great resource on Maui to try new scopes, see how the sky appears. But if you ever go back to UH, 18 years ago I took his class, Astronomy uh, 101. He's still there today teaching. He's even more involved because they're building this science building. They're going to be expanding science there. And if you pick up uh, one of the U UH, um, their catalog here, they also have a degree program in engineering technology, which is teaching about optics and robotics. And it's kind of there to prep people to work on the observatory so you have a better understanding of that kind of work. So check it out in here, engineering technology. It's great. And I'm sure uh, John Pye will be involved with that more. And when the science building gets built, it'll be a, a great, great uh, astronomy program, I'm sure. But yeah, John Pye. Uh, he was my first astronomy teacher, and, and I told him about Tour of the Stars and that I started the Maui Astronomy Clubs. And he goes, Becky, you should try and apply for one of these space grants. It's a NASA space grant. They pay you to do work or a project or a study in astronomy. You write a report, and then you give a speech to peers who are doing the same thing. And I'm like, okay, I can try that. I could use the extra money. So um, the first space grant I, I got to do see if I have a picture of that, was looking at a monitor every day like this at streaks and dots and things like this. Like <laughs> we got to track asteroids and satellites. And we would look at images that were taken from the scopes on Haleakala, the Amos telescopes, the big one up there. You see them up there. And they would image during the night. And then during the day, there were like three of us students who were hired to analyze the data. And this, by the way, just so you guys know, this is a pan stars picture. This is not <laughs> from the past. I didn't have any pictures from the past. But this is from <laughs> pan stars, and it's, it's kind of what it looked like. Uh, we were looking at dots and streaks. And, and uh, it was great. It was so great. I learned so much. We would, we would detect, like, like, say this is an asteroid right here. Oops, sorry. This asteroid. And we would detect that and say, yeah, we got it. But then we would notice other things in the picture. And, they happen to be new asteroid discoveries. So just in the few years that I did this space grant, our team of students, how many did we discover? We discovered 10 or 59 new asteroids. And then over five years, 10,000 new asteroids were discovered just analyzing this data. And they had so much data. It's, it was overwhelming, the data. So this was great. I got a little space grant to do this. I gave a talk, and I was telling John Pye, you know, I said, you know, I kind of, this was interesting, but I'm really into going out at night under the stars using a scope. I mean, that's really what I love to do. And he said, well, just so happens that Boeing, this is where I was working. This is from Boeing. Do you guys know where Boeing is in Kihei? It's on Lapoa Street. It's near the, uh, um, what is that, the supercomputer? And it's right back to the... Research and Technology Center. So that's where Boeing is. So that's where we were hired to do this work. And then um, Boeing was saying, wow, you should tr try this other. Um, we want you to try another space grant because we want to do the same thing that Amos is doing up here, the multi-million dollar telescope. And time on it is very expensive. Uh, we're going to have like off-the-shelf telescopes, like the scopes you're going to see tonight in the parking lot, with just using those to track asteroids and satellites. And it'd be a lot cheaper, faster, you know? It, it, it would just be, so it, this was called the Raven Program. So I got to start, let me see if this is a, 
the Raven program. Okay, there's John Pye when he had dark hair. <laughs> and uh, I'm in there too on the, on the side. But this was the Raven program where we had, um, you know, just off-the-shelf telescopes. We put cameras on and CCDs and monitors, and we would do the same kind of imaging. We would image the sky looking for asteroids, satellites. And then during the day, we'd come in and, and analyze the data and find more and more and more asteroids. So amateur astronomers, just so you know, do this kind of work, like the real serious um, high-end kind of amateurs who constantly are discovering things, asteroids, comets, stars with planets, you know, all these things. So it's pretty simple if you know what you're doing. So um, I got to meet my husband at Boeing. He's the smartest man in the world. <laughs> And the most patient, because he had to train me, right? <laughs> there he is right there, Paul Sidney. <laughs> he's an astrophysicist for, uh, he used to work for Boeing. Now he's uh, doing uh, for another company, PDS. But uh, he taught me everything uh, in asteroid detection and satellite tracking and how to use the software. I was hired on by Boeing. They said, hey, after your space grant, we'd like to hire you on because there's so much data. We just need someone to help. So I did work for Boeing for three more years after that, just analyzing more data and got to work with Paul. That was great. <laughs> then I met, through Boeing, this man. His name is David Dunham. He is the king of what's called asteroidal occultations. This is what it is. You have a star twinkling here, and then an asteroid, when it passes in front of it, the star blinks out. You don't see it. And then as the asteroid goes on, then the star pops out again. So that's, that's his love, his passion. He's been doing it for, oh, I don't know how many years, 40 years. He does asteroid occultations. Or, or even when a planet passes in front of a star and it blocks out the star, he would also observe those. He's really into any kind of occultation. Occultation means like an occult, you know, hidden. It's hiding. So um, he was on Maui because there was this asteroid called Interamnia, and it was visible from Japan and Hawaii, and it was going to pass in front of a star, and he came here just to record it. But he needed some volunteers, people with scopes, and so he heard about me because I was at Tour of the Stars. So he, uh, he said, Becky, can you uh, help me with this? And I went, yeah, sure. Now, this was a... a as an amateur, you know, doing all this science stuff, it was scary to me because I don't really know math and all that physics and the computer stuff. And uh, so I was really intimidated. He goes, I'll set you up. You'll be fine. All right, great. This was one of the most scariest events of my life. No, literally. I, he, it was like 11 o'clock at night. And he said, okay, I'm going to place you in North Maui. Do you guys know like Honolulu Bay? Okay, you go past there. And it's scary, you know, at night, like nothing, no homes. There's like maybe pineapple fields, cliffs, <laughs> trees that kind of whisper. But anyways, I was out there all by myself, 11 o'clock at night. I had all this like high-tech equipment, you know, monitors, computers, telescope. I had this WWVH radio going constantly because we had to, you know, record the exact time, you know. And, and uh, the radio was my best friend. I was just so happy to hear the radio. And I could hear these cars, like, in the distance, you know, loud music pumping and the guys screaming. I'm like, ah! <laughs> I was so scared. I was 10 feet off the road. If they saw me, I don't know what I would have done. I was scared to death. Um, but um, I, I got to do this occultation. Let me show you. Um, this is, uh, David is the president of this uh, International Occultation and Timing Association. So he still is today uh, the president. Um, this is, uh, I can't believe this was on the internet. I went and researched this to see if there was any record of this. And I found the video. There was an actual video and the report. I couldn't believe it. But right over here, the asteroid is, has covered a star, like way over in the corner. You'll see, see the star up here in the lower corner? You can actually see it's kind of shaved off because the asteroid is there. And then it comes more and then more and then more. And it was only like maybe two and a half seconds, you know? And at the time it was passing, I was looking in the eyepiece and I saw it happen and I'm like, the stars have aligned. It was just so awesome, right? I got to see it with my eye. 
And then um, right after it passed, I unplugged that puppy and I was out of there. I was like, okay, I got the recording, I'm out, okay. And so uh, I remember that so distinctly. And then this is the report David wrote up. Check this out. <laughs> so it's like Becky Sidney's eight inch telescope and the camera and the star field. Uh, it included the WWVH tone. And then watch this, um, let's see, okay, there was, there was supposed to be a second star that was going to disappear. It was a companion star, a secondary star. Uh, it should have disappeared five seconds before the primary. Uh, it says, uh, where else does it say? It says, good event times were obtained from that recording, but it will probably not show the companion since it was made with, okay, Becky Sidney's reappearance is here, okay, but it might not show the companion since she turned off the camcorder only about a second after. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I swear, as soon as it happened, I was out of there. But he, it, he didn't know that how scared I was, but he reported it like, wow, man, not even a second, she's out of there, okay. <laughs> I was so scared, I'll, I'll never do that again. But, um, yeah, that was really an awesome, awesome experience. And you can get these experiences, especially through, you know, John Pye and J.D. Armstrong. These are the guys you want to network with to get into these different arenas of astronomy. There's internships you can apply for. And All right, so that was really fun. David Dunham asked me to come to Maryland um, to watch the Venus Transit. Does anybody here know the Venus Transit, what it is? Okay, I see a few no's. Okay, a Venus transit, it's kind of like an occultation, but um, here's the sun, and Venus, when, it, when it's directly aligned, it passes right in front of the sun. So you see a little black dot, and you can watch it for like six hours. So it's a really long event, right? So Venus passes in front. And I'm like, wow, this would be such a great opportunity. I live in West Virginia, right next door. I'll just pop down to Maryland. He was from John Hopkins University. So I went there and met him. And we drove to this very uh, remote Amish town. It was, there were no lights. I mean, it was so dark. And, but it was a Am little Amish town. And the sun is rising in this picture. And that's when the transit was happening. And see how it's kind of cloudy? We could see with our naked eye Venus. Normally you don't look at the sun, right? But when there's some clouds, you can, right? So we were able to see Venus with the naked eye for about just like 10, 15 minutes. As, and I did my little shaka. Here I am in Maryland doing the shaka. You know. <laughs> so Venus was transiting at that minute right there. I wish it would have come out better in that picture. But uh, that was awesome. Here's David Dunham setting up his little monitor and his gear. And he is just a, a diehard uh, astronomer. This is a picture I took with a little simple camera right through my little eyepiece of my scope. And you can see Venus on the edge there. And then it's, uh, it's going to get further and further and further and further and further. Do you guys still see it? Yeah. <laughs> and then the Amish people come down the road. <laughs> And they're looking at our stuff like, what are you guys doing in our town? You know, they were like, whoa, this is bizarre. But they were very happy. They're waving at us. And <laughs> I, I love the Amish. And right as they passed by, it, it completed. You can barely see Venus here in the very, very corner. That was the end of the, the Venus transit. Now, with the Venus transit, this is a really cool phenomenon because... You can predict when it happens, and the, and the ancient Mayans figured this out, and I don't know how they did it. I mean, listen to this pattern. Every 243 years, Venus transit will happen, right? It, it happens, and then eight years later, it happens again. And then after about 121 years, it happens again. And then eight years after that, you get it again. And then 105 years pass. It happens, and then eight years later, it happens again. So it's like, it's an interesting pattern. So pattern, 121 days, and then eight. 105 years, and then eight years. So that's the pattern of the Venus transit. The Mayans figured it out. So in 2004, when we had a transit, eight years later, which is what year? Yes! 
We have another Venus transit this year, you guys. This is once in a lifetime thing. You'll never see this again in your life. You must join the Maui Astronomy Club so you can see this with us. We're going to either go to Haleagala, maybe. I'm thinking a beach so we can have barbecue. You know, it's six hours. It's going to be from noon to six. Like, we might as well party. And everybody in the Maui Astronomy Club, I, I love to do star parties. So we'll probably do a beach star party for the next Venus transit. It's June 5th. Noon to six. And you won't see it again till 2117. So once in a lifetime, if you didn't see 2004, you've got to see this year. Well, I know that Hawaii has 100% of the visibility because it's a six hour long, you know, it's six hours long. So we see the entire six hour. Uh, I'm trying to think of California. No, California wouldn't see it all because, you know, it's three hours ahead. I wonder if Asia. I'll have to check on that. But I know that Hawaii is the only place where it's 100%. All of it is visible here. So I'm really hoping David Dunham comes here. And I, I'm, I would assume he would. This is David Dunham. Now, he was an interesting man. He wanted to record the Venus transit with the Cicadia cycle. Do you guys know locusts? The locusts, they have like the 17 year, like they come out, out of the ground every 17 years and they kill all the crops and then, and then they go under the ground for 17 years. And then, so he, they happen to be, you know, out this time of year. So he wanted to make sure that that cicada period was recorded with the Venus transit. I don't know if there's any correlation, but science is science. It's cool. <laughs> all right. Any, anybody know this man? <laughs> I'm talking about him. No, Jesus. <laughs> oh, JD wanted me to tell you guys he was trying to make this guy's face. He normally doesn't look like that. He doesn't take pictures like that. He he said he was Im Im imitating uh, this guy here. So, <laughs> um. Sheldon Cooper. Oh, Sheldon Cooper. That's it. <laughs> Well, um, right, right about the time when I met J.D., I, a lot of people throughout the, the years I've been doing astronomy say, do you teach astronomy? You should teach astronomy. So I started teaching at uh, the Vitech. Do you guys know about this? Like, yeah. they, they renamed it Adventure for Educational Adventure. So I do teach uh, at Vitech a couple times a year. This year I have a class in April. It's like three Friday nights and... It's great. We observe every night through a telescope, and JD graciously gives us a tour of the folks on Haleakala. We come here and, and use the folks. So JD has been so instrumental for not just the Maui Astronomy Club, the whole island of Maui, the whole community here. He has opened the doors to astronomy like nobody else has. Every high school has been with him. Clubs, groups. Uh, are there people here who work with JD? Any any students? No, I see. I see. See these girls here. So he's just so wonderful. He's really taken astronomy to oh. another level. Bless you. <laughs> and uh, also during the time I was teaching, I live right around the corner, and this facility was being built. And I'm like, are the stars aligning again? <laughs> what are the odds of this really cool Institute for Astronomy being built right across from my house? And so I was so anxious when it was built to meet the people here and see how I could get involved. And that's how I met JD. And he was just like, oh, head over heels, like, please bring your club in. P please use the Falks telescope as much as you want. I'm like, are you kidding? So he's our hero, right, everybody? <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Um, this is the Maui Astronomy Club when we were here one time. We were using the Falks Telescope. The Falks Telescope is on Haleakala. It's a huge telescope, but we get pictures like this. We had a seven-year-old Astronomy Club member take this. Seven-year-old girl. That's the Sunflower Galaxy. Just beautiful images from the Falks. This is Sombrero Galaxy. We took this picture. Oh, I just love the folks. I'm hoping to do the folks here in February. So if anybody um, wants to join us, I can email you the date, and we'll be doing pictures like this. So, oh, this is a globular cluster. I think this is M13. Yeah, I think it's M13. Uh, but Omega Centauri—that's my favorite globular. <laughs> 
Okay, what else do we have here? Here's JD giving us a talk, or giving us a tour, excuse me. This is the Big Falks Telescope next to him. So um, Maui Astronomy Club got to go up a few times to tour the facilities on Haleakala. So we get to do that sometimes. So if that's something you're interested in, it's a, a great, great thing. Anybody recognize this man? Yeah. Yay! He's another hero of mine. This is Alex Filipenko. Um, thank you to a club member, Ed Castro. He's not here tonight, a Maui Astronomy Club member. He says, Becky, you guys need a website. I went, oh... It's free, you know, I don't charge anyone. I don't have money to like do it. And he goes, I'm a web designer. I I'm gonna create this Maui Astronomy Club website for you. I'm like, you're an angel. So Alex Filipenko found the Maui Astronomy Club website and he contacted me and he said, hey, I'm coming on vacation to Maui with my wife, Noelle. I'd love to give your club a talk. I'm like, what? <laughs> this is my hero, right? He's a celebrity to me. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, my God. So I called J.D. right away. I'm like, J.D., Alex Filipenko. <laughs> I called, and he wants to give a talk. I don't know where we could do it. Could we do it at IFA? And he's like, well, of course. So we had Alex. This is him here giving his talk. He did it twice in 2010 and 2011. So thank you, IFA, for helping me with that. He's, he, that was just a wonderful talk. This man is uh, the most quoted astronomer uh, ever, or not ever, but now. Um, he's on every science channel, like History Channel. You know those astronomy programs they do on cable? History Science Channel. Uh, he's, he's on those. You'll see him on every single one of them. And he was talking about uh, dark energy and the runaway universe. That was so exciting. That's probably the highlight of 2011 for me, was Alex coming. <laughs> Here's Alex and my husband Paul and JD, <laughs> three cool guys in astronomy. <laughs> this is JD giving, this is the last thing the Maui Astronomy Club did um, in uh, November. Um, actually, this is my class from Vitech, excuse me. Uh, I took the, my class, Vitech, up here uh, on Haleakala to tour the facilities up there. So this is us on a beautiful day. We're pointing to all the good stuff. That's, that's where all the good stuff is, right? <laughs> and um, I just want to end my talk with uh, letting you guys know there's lots of resources here on Maui. Definitely check out the Hyatt Regency Tour of the Stars. Contact me if you want to go, because I can probably get you in free through the, the Eddie. He's the astronomer there, and he's really good friends with me. So it's usually 25 bucks a person. So be sure to call me if you want to go. Also, if you're ever in Kanapali on Wednesday nights, I do free astronomy uh, on the beach walk right in front of the Weston from 8 to 9.30. And that's every week, every Wednesday. You can walk by. You can look at Jupiter, Venus, the moon. Saturn's coming soon. Mars is on its way. So we'll be observing lots throughout the 2012. Also in 2012, just so you guys know, for February... Uh, Venus and Jupiter are closing in. They're going to be closing in closer and closer to each, to each other. Right now, they're kind of far apart. February, Jupiter does this dramatic leap toward Venus. It, it'll be exciting to see them both in the scope together. In March, Mars is coming. So we'll have Mars to view in March. And in April, Saturn. And then May 20th, uh, there's a solar eclipse that will be visible here. An annular solar eclipse, we'll see it about 1 o'clock. That's May 20th. A Maui Astronomy Club will probably meet for that. So please join in if you want to meet and have more information on that. June 3rd and 4th, so like 11 o'clock at night going into the next day, there's a, a partial lunar eclipse that we'll see in Hawaii. So that's going to be at 1 a.m. <laughs> so if you want to do that and you're a trooper, we, we do late night uh, events. June 5th, the Venus transit. So please mark your calendars for that. The Venus transit, once in a lifetime. Got to see it. November 28th, there's another lunar eclipse that Maui will see at moon, when the moon is setting. And then uh, December 21st, you know, the world ends. So, you know, just, no, so you want to get everything done before then, right? So. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be uh, setting up scopes outside, so you guys, if, if you have any questions, you can ask later or come out and talk to me about anything. But thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed the talk and learned something. Thank you very much.
All right. Well, thank you, Becky. We thank appreciate you. it. Um, Becky, by the way, is also uh, one of the people who uh, helps me find these excellent speakers like uh, Alex Filipenko. Uh, we, I was first put in touch to, to Alex with, uh, through Becky. Our next speaker is Steve McGee. He's uh, an amateur astronomer here on Maui. He's part of the Haleakala Amateur Astronomy Club. Uh, he's been a member for uh, prox or sorry, Haleakala Amateur Astronomers. I have to make at least one mistake in every introduction, right? <laughs> so he's a member of the Haleakala Amateur Astronomers. He's been a member for about three years and has been doing a lot of, of uh, work with binary stars. He's going to tell you why that's scientifically interesting and why it's still important to continue those observations. So give a big hand to Steve. Thank you. Uh, again. Thank you very much. I can't hug you. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Good. Okay. Let's see, I put this. Just put the drop in your pocket and put it to your pocket. Yeah. Like and somewhere up here. How, oh, I, way up here. Right there is perfect. You just flip it on. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Good. And your clicker, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Well, I'm, I'm really not going to talk about astronomy. No, I, I have you all now as a captive audience. We're going to discuss the finer points of timeshare ownership. Uh, I, I sense a rebellion. I think I better table that discussion. Yes. <laughs> Tattooing, yeah, notice what we have. Two stars, okay, this is uh, back to the future, I guess you might call it. Yeah, we, we, we provide transportation, yeah. So uh, I'm here to talk a little about some of my work with uh, binary stars. Uh, I have a very uh, great opportunity to go up to Haleakala and observe. I keep my scope up there with the uh, astronomy uh, people that some of you, some of us are here tonight, well represented, I see, and uh, I'm going to talk first. Give you a little history, little history on astronomy. I'm preaching to the choir, so some of you already know all this stuff, so that's all right. But I'm just going to kind of bring you up to speed on some of the ancient history of astronomy, and then going into binaries and and double stars. And then going, I'll go into how I observe them, and then I'll go into some of the new things that are happening in uh, binary star work. So I'm sure you all know who this is, Pythagoras. He was, he was uh, probably the most influential mathematician of his day, 495 BC. He probably created the paradigm shift of science of the time that, uh, that pe people just, uh, he was a great mathematician, a mystic, a scientist, of course the Pythagorean theory and his ideas about the harmony of the spheres and uh, how everything is in tune. He basically set the stage for, for uh, science and math and, and the development of uh, astronomy. And of course, we know Copernicus. He was uh, 16th century BC. He, his basic uh, discovery or or presentation was the heliocentric model. At the time, the church, of course, didn't believe that anything but the Earth was the center of the universe. And he came up with this idea, and 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 it was. At the time, it was like all science, it was an idea first, and then they had to prove it. They had to observe it. And uh, so many people in between. Here we have Johann Kepler, who uh, took the uh, heliocentric model and developed it, created the three laws of, no of motion, planetary motion, and uh, gave us what we still use today, the law Kepler's laws, Kepler's three laws. We still... Still use them today. We send we send uh, uh, spaceships to to Pluto with Kepler's laws. You know, it's 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 still happening. 
And of course, Galileo took Kepler's laws with Isaac Newton and formulated the laws of gravity, introduced the telescope, and established the uh, periods of the moons of Jupiter, among other things. Now I'm going to give you eight different people. I'm moving in now to the development of binary star work by different people throughout the ages. Bernadetto Castelli worked with Galileo. He discovered, uh, with, a, with a telescope, he discovered the uh, binary star Mizar, which is in Ursa Major. And some of you probably know the Big Dipper. It's the second star of the Big Dipper. It's actually Mizar and Alcor are, are a visual binary. You can actually look up in the sky and see the two stars together. It's a good test of your vision, by the way. If you can see them, you're doing good. You're doing quite well. Well, uh, Castelli thought there was another star around Mizar. And he, they uh, observed it with a telescope with uh, Galileo and discovered uh, um, uh, Mizar's uh, B. It's uh, Ursa, in Ursa Major, Mizar. It's 14, in, uh, 14 arc, sep uh, arc second separation. Giovanni Cassini. Of course, everybody knows him of the divisions of the rings of Saturn, right? That's the Cassini rings. He discovered Castor's companion in Gemini. And uh, it's only a two arc second separation. And that was in the 1670s. And later, John Flamsteed produced a catalog of 3,400 stars. It was one of the first definitive catalogs of the day, which led to uh, William Herschel, Right here, it looks like somebody from the uh, early American history, right? And uh, he was the first to confirm systems under mutual gravitational attraction. What's that? Systems of stars that are orbiting each other. Okay, that's, that was a big breakthrough at the time. And he confirmed 800 physical binary systems. From there? What's a binary? A binary system is a star that is orbited by another star just like a planet orbits the sun. And in some cases, there's more than one. In many cases, there's many. There could be many stars. And it, it leads also to the concept that there are planets as well as stars in a binary system. And I'll get into that a little later. You're, you're getting ahead. But yeah, the, in, the, in this day, all they could see were the stars. They couldn't see planets in, around any of these stars. And they were very intrigued because before, they, they had no idea that a star could orbit around another star. And uh, so they started measuring. And, and then, of course, you've got Frederick George Wilhelm Struve, right, this guy right here. And he is probably one of the definitive double star uh, observers. His son, Otto von Struve, carried on his work. And uh, in 1837, Struve published a catalog of 2,700 binary stars. Later, his son found many thousand more. Back in the 1850s, they were discovering this was a big thing. And it became the vogue for, for dignitaries and aristocrats and rich industrialists. They'd go and they'd buy a scope and they'd set it up in their backyard and they'd observe binary stars. It was a big thing back then and, and it's as it is in today in a lot of ways. And then you've got um, Robert Innes. Innes is a, a, an astronomer from the southern hemisphere. He cataloged 1,600 southern stars back in 1927. Binary stars, double stars. And then Robert Aitken has a very definitive catalog of 17,180 binary stars. From there, we go to the Washington Double Star Catalog. I don't have any pictures of it, but the definitive catalog of double stars is the Washington Double Star Catalog. It's based at the U.S. Naval Academy Observatory. In July of 2006, they had recorded 102, 387,000 stars in their catalog. And that's just in this, in this, in our Milky Way, in our galaxy. They can't see binary stars in any other galaxies. Along with that, whoops, sorry. I'm going way beyond. Okay. Along with that, you have neglected double stars. And this is where amateurs come into play. 
uh, neglected double stars have to fit a certain series of criteria, but one of them is that they have not been observed in 20 years uh, or, and or they're unconfirmed. And in their catalog, they have 39,585 stars, not 86, not 84. <laughs> 30, over 39,000 stars that you and I can go and observe and, and we can log and we can contribute to the, uh, to the catalog, the, the uh, neglected double star catalog. And they are asking astronomers, uh, amateur astronomers like you and me, to do this. And uh, of pairs that are greater than three arc seconds, there's roughly 6,400 stars that are above... 20 degrees declination, which is Hawaii and north to the northern, uh, in the northern hemisphere. This man, I couldn't find a very good picture of him. This is Bob Argyle. He's in the International Astronomical Union Division of Double Stars and Multiples. And together with Sir Patrick Moore, I'm going to pass this book around. This is their book. You can touch, touch and feel that. <laughs> it was published in uh, 2000 and uh, I think 2003. So the observing and measuring visual double stars. It's basically the handbook for visual, visual double star work. It gives you all, basically all the information you need and all the techniques and all the, uh, uh, the equipment you're going to need and, and everything that's basic. And it also has a CD in there of the Washington Double Star Catalog, which you can go online and download anyway. But, but uh, it's a very definitive book. And, of course, it leads us to today, the most important double star observer. <laughs> right. So what are double stars? You can look in the Pleiades, and you can see them. A lot of these are double stars. Doubles, 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 doubles. There's a thousand stars in the Pleiades. And with the naked eye, if you can bake out six, you're doing good. If you can see seven, you're... You've got really good vision. You can see real well. With a pair of binoculars, you can see some of the doubles. You don't even need a telescope. And with a good scope, you can measure them. And uh, so uh, the Pleiades are packed full of double stars. Now I'm going to give you four real common double stars. Rigel is in Orion. Orion's in the sky right now. It's one of the feet. And everybody's familiar with Orion, the three, Orion's belt, the three stars of his belt. And, and Rigel is, uh, actually, it's uh, Beta Origenis. And it has a companion star that is only 9.5 arc seconds. And what is an arc second, by the way? I wanted to clear that up. Uh, the entire 360 degrees around the Earth is 360 degrees, and one minute is one sixtieth, and one arc second, or one minute is a sixtieth of a degree, and an arc second is a sixtieth of an arc minute. So it's a really small amount of space. You have to use a telescope to see it. And Rigel's companion is nine arc seconds away. Rigel is very bright, so it's hard to separate that. Alberio, on the other hand, is in Cygnus, and its separation is 34 arc seconds, so it's pretty easy to see. With a very small scope, you can see it. It's one of the most renowned, most famous du double stars. It's actually a uh, debate as to whether or not it really does orbit the primary star, but you'll notice it seems like this one is blue, and, it, and it's actually very blue when you see it in the sky in a small scope. It's very blue, and the, and the, the uh, primary is quite orangish, reddish orange, yellow. <laughs> it's a very pretty combination. And Corcoroli is in Canis Venetici. It's a 19 arc second sap, and it's a very uh, pretty sight in a scope. And Gamma Aries is uh, in Aries, also in the sky. Three of these are in the sky right now. Uh, Alberio is in Cygnus. It's not in the sky right now, but it will be in the summer. So what do, what do I like to do? I like to, to record these. Well, how do you record them? Well, one of the things you do, the, thing, the two things you basically do is you record the separation, 
and then you record the position angle in relation to north. So if north is straight up, this, is, this would be about, what, a 45 degree angle, just, just hypothetically, right? So how do you look at, a, in the, at this binary through your telescope and figure it out? Well, it basically works like, it's, it's like a planet. It's orbiting the star just like a planet in an elliptical orbit, Kepler's third law. And this is Sirius in Canis Major. Everybody probably knows it's one of the closest stars to us. It's in the sky right now. It comes up about 10 o'clock at night. If you look east, it's the brightest star up there. And its companion takes about 50 years to orbit it. And it's really kind of hard to see, but it's getting a little more separated. Separated Now it's about four arc seconds out. Here's the primary, and it's coming out. So it's, it's going to go back. This was 1960, but as you can see, it's going out. And what do you do? You, you basically take a series of observations. Somebody took an observation in 1960. Someone took one in 1970, one in 80, one in 90, one in 2000, and all the way around, okay? And established the trajectory of that orbit, okay? By making various plots. That's why you had said they were disregarded or something, binaries, what were those called? Uh, they're... Um, Neglected. Neglected. They're neglected because you need more observations to be able to tell how the planets yes. and the sun circle each other. Yes. Understand. And, but the neglected ones are ones, because there's so many, there's not enough people to, to observe them. Plus, they haven't been observed in 20 years. Or they haven't, they haven't been confirmed. But a, a neg that is a, uh, this is what you basically do. You, you follow it. It's, however, I have to go backtrack because there's some that take a thousand years to orbit. So you can't uh, observe it. But you can observe today and ten years from now you can observe it. And you could actually, by, by two observations, you can start to project its trajectory. And this is what you do, basically. You can do the best you can with it. And uh, you can go to the like with a double star catalog, it'll give you the plots over the years. So, in some cases, the stars are simply sharing proper motion. They're just going together in the sky, but one is moving ever so slightly in a trajectory of an orbit around the other. Yeah. So how do you observe them? You use a little eyepiece like this. This is, there's th different ways to do it, but an amateur uses a small eyepiece like this, a 12 millimeter eyepiece that has a little battery and a light in it and a little turn knob and inside the, the, inside the uh, reticle is an etching in the glass. It's not a very good picture, but I got others. And when you look through it, you put the star, the primary star is here, the companion is here. Okay? So you get it. You have to find the star. Then you put them along that line. You can turn the, the eyepiece. It's loose in that you actually loosen it in the holder. And then you can turn the eyepiece until that you get that primary in the very center here. And you get the companion over there. Now you've got a line with a series of what we call ticks, okay? And here's an example of it in a diagram. You put the star in the center, and you put it along this, this line. And this is called the lineal di diameter scale. And you measure it. Well, wait a second now. Becky's got an eight inch scope. I got a nine and a quarter. And how, well, how many is yours? A Eight, and yours is a 12 and a half. You put the same eyepiece in, it's going to give you a different separation, right? Anybody who knows optics and, and knows <coughs> focal lengths. So she's going to look at the same star, and it's going to be over to 40. And, and she'll look at the star, and it'll be at uh, 37. So what do you do? You have to establish a scale constant. Uh, okay. And 
Let me get back to where I am on my... Uh, so, establish a, a scale constant. Guess what? I'm throwing a, I'm throwing a <laughs> formula at you. Okay, I see somebody yawning. It's not over yet. Okay, <laughs> here it is. Here it is, the formula. The formula is the scale constant, which is Z, okay, on the scale. Let's go back to the scale. That's the scale, okay. The scale constant is, in arc seconds, you have a, a, a time average of a drift of a star across that scale. So you find a sky, star, star that's about 60 degrees declination, and you turn off your scope and you let it drift across that scale. And then you turn the scope back on. You sleep the scope and you time it with a, with a stopwatch. And then you do it again. 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 Maybe you do it 20 times. And then you come back the next week and do it at 20 times more. What do you do? You make an average of that time in seconds. Okay? The declination of the star, you take a cosine of the declination of the star, it's simply a, ma a ma math uh, ma <laughs> multiplication, and you multiply it by the sidereal motion in arc seconds of the Earth's rotation, 15.0411. I know it's a lot. Some of you are getting it. That's all right. I'm not expecting you to get it. Okay? There are 50, and D is, the, is 50 because... There's 50 ticks, okay? So you divide it by 50. And that's what gives the scale constant for your scope with this eyepiece. Okay, so. Presumably that, that all of the eyepiece manufacturers, whether they show 30 or 50 for D, that distance between them is identical. They no, if it's a 30, if, it, if, the, uh, if it's th 30, then you use 30 in the subdemand denominator. If it's 30 ticks. They have made they've made those ticks the same width. Somehow. They may have. They may have. I, I couldn't tell, but you use you use thirty for the division if there's only thirty. If there's fifty, you use fifty. Yeah. So that's how you fit it in the formula to come up with the scale constant. Okay. This is for the mead. Uh, so you're talking probably about the Celestron, which I think has d a different number of ticks. Yeah. So That's basically what you do to get the separation, okay? You figure that there's maybe three arc seconds per tick. Let's throw that number out. Well, that's what we have in the, of the observation. So let's go to the observation. Corcaroli, okay? Ma uh, lit, the lit says, literature that you li read about, it's listed as 19.3 arc seconds. So you put the, the prim primary star on the scale, you put the secondary or, or companion there, and you measure the arc seconds, and it comes to two ticks. And it's, your scale constant is 9.5 arc seconds per tick. So in that observation, you come up with 19 arc seconds. The set is 19.3. Yeah? So you're saying you time it so you stop tracking and then let it drift? And then start to, to, to get the scale constant, um, to make the scale constant initially, to establish the scale constant for the lineal scale, you have to do that. Okay. You run the formula, and then once you get your scale constant, so tracking, you that's it. it and then, and yeah. Then you can go to any star in the sky, place it on the, on the lineal scale, multiply it by your, your scale constant, and that's the sep, the separation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that, that calibrates it for my particular scope. In order for you to do it for your scope, you've got to do the drift t 10, 20 times, do the average, run the formula, get your scale constant, and then you can use this, the eyepiece in that configuration in your scope to get the separation. <laughs> So let's go back to the observation. Well, we, al we also want to find out the position angle. 
it's telling us the position angle is 228.5 degrees. So what you do is you line the two stars up in the eyepiece along the lineal scale. And in this case, you, t you drift. You turn the scope off. You sleep it. You let it drift. It goes to a point on the, e on the 360 scale. You read it. In this case, it's 132, but you reverse it because it's, you're using a diagonal. So you go to a reverse scale, and it's 322 would be, let's see what the, the number was, 132. So 132 is 228, and the lit is 228. You do a couple of observations. You can do it with a, a Barlow here. This is a, a, a Barlow increases the magnification of the eyepiece, OK? You do use the Barlow. You're, you, in this case, you get three arc seconds per tick in your scale constant. You have to do the same process again. Drift the star 20 times, put the number in the, uh, in the formula, come up with a scale constant, and that is what you use whenever you use a Barlow with, with the astrometric eyepiece. And the first time, you get 18. You try it a second time, you get 19.5, 19.5, 19.3. So that's what I like to do. And why do I like to do it? Because it's a mathematical. It's astronomy with math, OK? <laughs> it's astronomy with math. That's why I like to do it. And it's fun, because all night long, you can go from star to star, and you can do, do your drawings and you know <laughs> do it. So that's what I like to do. But why do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, there's a lot of people that are studying binary stars, and we, sh we exchange our information. OK, there's a couple of binary star uh, groups on Yahoo that we can report to. And uh, there's also the Journal of Double Stars Observers. And one of the principal contributors to it is Russell Gennett, who's going to be here next month to speak. Yay! So I'm very excited about that. He's out of Cal, uh, Cal Poly Tech in San Luis Obispo. And uh, so that's, that's basically uh, observing double stars. It's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, lot of math, and, uh, and it's very painstaking. It's not just looking at a galaxy and saying, oh, isn't that pretty? It's you know, fun and whatever. It's doing something. And, and also, you want to notate the colors. Companion is rust, primary is yellow. And you want to do a little sketch. So you put in a nice wide eyepiece. Well, here I've used a pretty wide eyepiece with a Barlow. So it's 145 power. It's pretty, pretty tight, pretty tight. And you plot them. Well, the PA is 228. Here's north, here's east. 228 is roughly there. So you can confirm it with just a drawing. OK? You don't really need to go through the whole you know, astrometric eyepiece thing and everything, but it's nice to confirm it with a drawing. It's it's a lot of fun to do that. Yes, well, there is literature on it, and in other words, there's lists of binary stars that you can go and you can, and that's where I get this information. The literature literature says the SEP is 19, and it says the PA position angle is 228. So the fun part is to see if you can get it. Yeah, how close can you get it, you know? And you may have to do it six or eight times. The learning curve is learning how to use the equipment, learning how to use the eyepiece, practicing with it. And I spent about two years just trying to get a reading. <laughs> but, you know, you got to be determined. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't give up. <laughs> I didn't give up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the process now of my divorce. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what's going on today? Kepler, yay. Kepler. I'm sure most of us know what Kepler is and what it's doing. Anybody not know about the Kepler telescope? Okay, the Kepler telescope is a space based telescope that is looking at a section of the sky in, in Cygnus. Cygnus is just set, so you can't see it. But next fall come, or summer, it's in the Great Summer Triangle. Hold your, wrist, your fist up 
His alberio, the, the double star alberio that I just talked about, most of us know what si the, the constellation Cygnus. If you don't, it's a very beautiful constellation. This area of the sky, Lyra is right here. So it's right sort of in the edge of Cygnus and, the, and almost part of Lyra. There's 145,000 stars that it's been looking at and photographing daily, hourly, by the minute since 2000 and what, 2000 and something. Three and a half years, it's gonna be, it went up in 2009. It's almost over there, trying to extend it, actually. And uh, it, it's using a photometer. It's a super big CD camera. I can't give you the statistics on the CD cameras. I think it's the equivalent of 64 CD cameras in one, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I don't know. What does it do? It's looking for, for stars that have planets. Now, how does that relate to double stars? Well, double stars are basically a star with a planet that happens to be a star. <laughs> right? What's a brown dwarf? How do you define the difference between a brown dwarf and a, and a Jupiter planet? Not a heck of a lot, right? Not a heck of a lot. So why is binary stargazing important? Because we're looking for planets. Are we going to go there? Maybe not. Not in our lifetime. But it's an exercise, all right? We spend a lot of money to send this guy up to do what we like to do, looking at binaries. But what is it, what is it giving us? It's giving us, it's giving us 11 confirmed systems of circumbinary uh, planets already discovered within the three years it's been up. 11 doesn't sound like much, but 11, that means that there's 11 binary star systems that have planets as well going around them. So I guess the excitement for me is if I'm looking at a binary star, I'm possibly looking at planets too. I'm looking right there at that area where there are planets. An example of the most recent one is Kepler 16 ABB. Okay, here's A, here's B, here's B. It's an artist's conception. We can't see either of those, any of those with a little telescope. But what they do is they examine that star over a period of time, and the star is wobbling. It's wobbling because of the gravity being exerted on it by the other star, as well as the gravity being exerted by, it by the planet. So it's got a double wobble. <laughs> and it also, in many cases, but not all, it has an eclipse, like our our Jupiter crossing, or I mean our, our Venus crossing the sun, which we're going to see this year. In some cases, they can, they, um, Kepler has, has observed eclipses. And that's what they're using to detect stars that are, that are with planets, looking for exoplanets. And there's a good example of Kepler ABB. Here, this is a sped up version. There's the primary star, the secondary star, and the planet. I don't know. I just li I lifted it off the Kepler site. <laughs> yeah. But that's basically what it's doing. You notice there's a time when it eclipses it, okay? And then there's another time when the, the planet eclipses it. When that happens, it, 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 it transits, it, it wobbles, but it also reduces its magnitude ever so slightly. And this is what the, the, the photometry and the Kepler scope is detecting. They can't see it, but they see that the changes in magnitude. They also see the wobble. You notice neither of them are stationary. None of them are stationary. Kepler's third law. It's gravity pulling it around. Those are all in the same plane, are they? They are in this, in, in this artist's conception. Yeah. It's an artist's conception. That's a good question. I, I couldn't answer that. May, somebody else here may know, but they, it's uh, maybe by arbitrary. I don't know. I, I doubt if it's arbitrary. I think there's a lot of, they've already detected a lot of double stars and a lot of uh, stars that are candidates for uh, planetary um, systems. Yeah. So uh, I guess in a sense, looking at binary stars is is uh, looking for planets. Maybe that's what I really want to do. <laughs> but I'm having a lot of fun with it. So thank you guys a whole lot and I appreciate your attention.
So if we'll get Becky to come up here. You can ask questions of either one. Oh. Uh, well, Becky's coming up. I'd like to make an announcement for the HAA. Uh, we have a gentleman that is providing some optical equipment oh. to the IFA. You want it? And uh, we've had the primary mirror, a 32-inch primary mirror, here. for a uh, telescope, which we call the HAA Sister Harlington, which is the name of the gentleman that's providing this. 80 is for 80 centimeter diameter. We've had the primary for uh, quite a while, and we just got the secondary back again uh, yesterday, and it will be assembled. It, the telescope was already partially assembled in Waiakoa up in Kula, and uh, then it will later, not in the not too many months, be installed up in the uh, Roloff Observatory where so many of our HAA fellows have been observing from. So it's kind of an alert to those fellows. And I saw a photograph of the inside of that with your telescope. Yeah. And those, will, those, will be, those will be being removed. And then this 32 inch will be put up there. And then it will be used by some scientists to do some work with some a polarimeter, which is a device that examines the polarized character of the light coming from it. Well, when we finally get that all working well, then it's going to be handed over to the uh, for management of the telescope after it's running to uh, Rob Rakowski, who will be scheduling a lot of the amateur uh, activity with it. So our our club or our mutual clubs, including Mexico, Oops. will have that available for people that want to go up and uh, observe with the 32 inch. It's a Cassegrain telescope, and its overall f number is f9. So. Anyhow, that's kind of exciting. We could also use some help from some of the amateurs, so we can get a hold of Rob when he gets back in a couple of weeks, uh, because we're going to need some help painting and prepping the telescope uh, after the fit test part of the assembly is done, so we can use some assistance there. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but Perfect. That's kind of interesting. Great. Yes, and great. Can you imagine finding double stars with a 32-inch? Yeah. We'll be doing it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that is, so for those in uh, who are not here watching this live uh, or are streaming, we were just discussing a new telescope uh, that will be operated by the Haleakala Amateur Astronomers up on Haleakala, and they will need some help uh, with installation and prepar preparation of that. All right. So let's start off now. Any questions? There was one slide that had the four different binary sources. Can we go to that one for a second? Yeah. Question okay. Yeah. So we have a question about the four binary stars here. And I'll repeat the question, then hand off to Steve. Uh oh. <laughs> that one. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether those uh, images of the stars are life size or whether they've somehow been inflated and if those distances are correct? I, they seem very close together, yeah. almost like they're, you know, spinning like tops against each other, given how close they are. Is there some, because of the photos taken, are they, in fact, actually much smaller in real scale, and because of the distance that somehow gets spread, or, or I'm, I'm so, a very amateur spot. So the, uh, they just look really close together. So the, the question is that the stars in this image seem very close together, and is there some sort of effect that uh, is not accurately representing the distances compared to the scale of the stars? Yes. Like I'm, yes. If I was imagining it, I would expect, like, say, let's say Jupiter was a small star, um, and our sun was a star. I would expect mm -hmm. sort of distances like that, and there'd be a much broader range, and they, and they wouldn't look that big relative to one another. Right. So they should be yeah. 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 They, they, they aren't to scale. There should be a point source, but they aren't, they aren't to scale. They're lifted off of uh, Jeremy Perez's uh, website, Delta Venus. I don't know. He's a, these are sketches that he did. These are sketches. They are not photographs. Okay. What he does is he, he observes them very similar to the way I showed you. I observed uh, the little sketch of a star in a white uh, paper black pencil. Then he reverses it, puts it in Photoshop, cleans it up, adds some color, and puts it on his website. Now, Rigel is 9.5 arc seconds away from its, it, I mean, its companion is no, only 9.5 arc seconds, whereas Alberio is 34 arc seconds. Well, that's kind of, well, let's see. Let's do that with your finger. Nine arc seconds, 
9999 not to scale. <coughs> not to scale. Okay. Rigel is really, it's really hard to see Rigel's bi uh, companion because it's so bright. You really have to, it's really hard to see it. Whereas with a Birio, it's very easy to see. You can see, I think you can see it with binoculars or a very small scope. Yeah. Yeah, they. I forget what it's called. Repeat the question. The, the, do they have a black dot that that actually blocks out most of the light of the star? And they do. Uh, you'd have to use a pretty large scope, and you 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 insert that in the um, in the optics. Occulter. Yeah, it's called an occulter. Yes. Yeah. And. Uh, now, Corcoroli is 19 arc seconds, and uh, Gamma Aries is uh, 7.8 arc seconds, so it's really not to scale. It just gives you an idea of their beauty uh, when you catch them uh, in the eyepiece. Yeah. Yes? Also, I believe the diameters are not to scale. Right. The diameters are not really to scale. They're, they're sort of expanded, blown up a little bit. The brighter they are, the bigger they are, the bigger they look. Yeah. And... And uh, the magnitudes on the stars are listed in the literature, so you can confirm the magnitude of the, of the primary and the secondary. But like I say, these are sketches that are made to kind of look good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how far from each other are these primaries? In some cases, there are a few parsecs, like the distance. There, oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question because they vary. They vary from the point of spinning. Spinning, I mean really spinning fast with like two knobs, stars that are so tight and spinning you can't even see them spin. They've actually photographed them all the way out to numbers of light years apart. That's how, that's how many different combinations of binary stars there are. Yeah. Now when a... When a, when a when a supernova occurs, sometimes a supernova occurs when the binary, it's accreting uh, energy from its companion to where it sucks all the energy out of its companion and eats it up and explodes. And that's a supernova, the type 1A, I think it's called, 1A supernova. But aren't there a lot of stars in between? The, the two, the there can be, there can be. You make many observations. <laughs> Much patience. No, you're, you're measuring the separation with your scale constant, and you're measuring the position angle with your 360 scale. Yeah, you let it drift, and you, you measure it. You have to measure it. And someone measured it back in 1690. Someone measured it in 1812. Someone measured it in 1920. Someone measured it in... It's 1960. Someone measured it last week. Now I'm measuring it. And with all those measurements, the trajectory of the orbit is established. Each, me each measurement set points it, puts it on an orbit pattern and confirms it. And that's, that's the fun exercise. And, and its position angle is also going to change. It'll, it'll slightly change because as it orbits around, it, it's in the Kepler law, it's going to make an ellipse, right? So the, the, it's going to go out, perihedron and whatever they call it, and it's going to come back in and get close. And the angle changes as it goes all the way around. Both of them are moving, yeah. They, like the, the animation showed it, it wobbles. It wobbles, yeah. It, 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 it's not a station. That's where, that's where math comes in. That's where math comes in. Yay. Do you a, yes. Do you have a site then against the background stars so you get a reference to the wobbles? Because if you have a background, if you have the binary like that, and a you background can. star is constant, if you then do a, a measurement of that distance and angle, you're beginning to get the wobbles. Right? Yes, you can. Yeah, I haven't do done that. that. No, I haven't done that. Let's try it. What happens, what happens if the background star is wobbling too? Uh oh, you got a problem. <laughs> you got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. How do you distinguish the companions from all the rest of the That's a good question. It's difficult. 
In some cases, they're equal magnitude. Two cat's eyes looking at you, two headlights in the sky. And that's really fun to see that. Magnitude is the only way. And, and in most cases, the magnitude is, is determined by really big scopes, you know, n nothing like what I've got or what most amateurs have. It's, it's established. And the, the U.S. Naval Observatory in, where is it, Connecticut, has a humongous scope. And they, they established the, the magnitude. There is a formula for establishing magnitude, which I don't use. So. so you just set up out here in the parking lot, and you know where, where the primary is. There's, there's got to be a, a whole bunch of other stars up there to confuse the companions. Yeah, there are. There are, but... Um, in most cases, when you see a binary, it's, it's, it pops out at you. It pops out as being a binary. You can, you, most of the common binaries that are, say, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, up to maybe 10th magnitude are pretty easy to, to differentiate. And yeah, it, once it gets beyond 11th magnitude, it's really hard to get with your scope anyway. But yes? Uh, that's a good question. Let me go back to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is not the only way to observe binary stars. This is the way for an amateur who loves the eyepiece. Okay, the eyepiece amateur is a world of his own. <laughs> and they have many other ways. Spectral f uh, photometry. photometry or yes. For, uh, yeah, infraterometry, which is CCD camera work. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Russ is going to discuss that. Ask Russ when he comes. Come to, to Russ Gennett's talk because he's, uh, he'll tell you all about it. He's going to be here in the middle of February, doing some work with, with CCD cameras on some binaries. And uh, th there's also what's called a filar metrometer, micrometer, filar, filar micro micrometer, which uses a wire. It's basically uh, an eyepiece like this. OK, there's your eyepiece. And across it are two wires. Those wires move. Okay, you can move that. You can move this wire anywhere you want. It's a filar micrometer. They're kind of expensive. I think they cost around a thousand bucks. I'd have one by now, but my wife controls the finances. <laughs> it's a filar micrometer, and and you 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 can place the two lines. Okay, in the, the stars in the two lines, it, you move the, and the, it was first made with, I think, cat hair or horse hair or something. <laughs> and it was homemade by, I, I, I can't remember the astronomer that did it, somebody like Cassini or way back. And you, you can move it, and again, you set up a scale constant, a mathematical equation, a scale constant that fits to that. And it's a very fine, fine, fine line. You can get very accurate readings. The other way is with spectral photometry. Infer, spectral, yes, I've never done it. It's, yeah, it's, it's really fast, so yeah, you could explain. Yeah, uh, well, no. Like, quickly. You're trying to take out the atmosphere itself is jittering things around. Right? Yes. But you, you actually are seeing the interference of one light, with one wavelength, uh, or one wavefront of one star with the other. And you can see the fringes from that, and you can reconstruct from the fringes. You could explain it better than I. You could, again, measure the separation, the variation. It's using photography, yeah, yeah. Or photographic plates, or or something like Photoshop, where you stack them. Yeah, Charles Worley at U.S. Naval Observatory. Yes, that's, way they're doing that's the way they're doing it now, and it's very very accurate. Does that rule out amateurs? No, it's just another way of doing it. Yeah, another way of doing it, and uh, I I don't know. I encourage you to try it. Come up to the summit sometime. I'm on Facebook. I always announce when I'm going. <laughs> I inv invite guests. <laughs>
Bring your own jacket. <laughs> More than that. <laughs> Gloves. Yeah. So I had a question for Becky. Yes, Paul. <laughs> okay, so, for, so David Dunham, right? So he had you guys all st set up different scopes around the, around the islands. And what was he trying to do? I mean, you were all timing the stars. So what was, what was, what was David Dunham trying to do? Measure just the size and the shape of the asteroid, the shadow and the direction. So from the, different points to pan. So the, the shadow of the asteroid, the shape, the outline of it, forms a shadow on the Earth. And then by having just scopes precisely timing it with WWB, they can figure out what its shape, what its, its outline, outline is, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to, can you repeat it for the mic? Oh. Um, when I was uh, working with David Dunham, when we were doing the uh, asteroid occultation, the purpose for that reading and that report was to measure the shadow of the asteroid. Therefore, you can determine the shape of it, the size of it, and we could see it moving, so we, we knew its trajectory and how fast it was going. So just more um, definitive information on the asteroids. So there's a big organization that does occultation timing stuff. Is that... Yeah, Dave, yeah, David Dunn, he's the president of that, and uh, lots of amateurs do it, too. Uh, yeah, not me, but <laughs> I did it once, but <laughs> yes. Will he be here for the event in June? I sure hope so. I'm going to email him uh, and, and see. That would be wonderful for him to be here and talk about it. He just, he does so much. Yeah, I hope it's a clear, beautiful day that day. <laughs> so we see it, you know. <laughs> And I just want to mention, you had asked about the space between some of the binaries. Um, that Albireo star, the space between them is six trillion miles. Yes. Just to give you an idea. I mean, just between that Thank binary. You. And it's like 400-year orbit. So you'd have to observe it for generations to really get it. And we do, right? They have right. records for right. hundreds of years. That, and then you get these accurate, accurate measurements over time. Yeah. Well, you just use it as models. You know, there's always models, and then you, you grow beyond those models. I mean, mm -hmm. astronomy has changed because of technology. We're, it's more precise. You know, we're seeing all kinds of stuff now. <laughs> In your astronomy class at the college, um, how many weeks is that? It's only three Fridays. Okay, so those three oh, Fridays. I had signed up at one point, and then I thought maybe I didn't have enough math. I have zero math background. <laughs> it, it's more, it's, really? I have very little math background. But you true. love it, you love it? I love it, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm learning for what I need it for. Okay, well. Wow. <laughs> yes, yes, I teach beginner astronomy, so you'll learn the stars and constellations and the types of objects, and we do lots of observing, and it's just basic astronomy. It's, yeah, beginners. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. The binary. Yeah. Yeah. They, I forget which probe I actually imaged it on the way out. That was Ida. Mm -hmm. Ida. The name of it is. The name of the asteroid is Ida. Ida. Like Idaho. I D A. Ida. I D A. They found a, a companion, an orbiting companion called Dactyl. And they found an orbiting companion called Dactyl. And they're they're basically gravitationally attracted. One or one basically orbits around the other. Mm -hmm. And there are many asteroids with satellite asteroids yeah. orbiting them. Many satellite asteroids. We actually landed on one. Yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I was going to say, I, I know you're pretty impressive, but land on an asteroid. Well, we didn't, we didn't land rapid. softly. That was the nearest space. Oh, yeah. really? Mirrors, yeah. Mirror, yeah. Oh. They're Russian. <laughs> yeah. So they actually had two, there were two probes that, that the nearest spacecraft that came up. Uh, uh, basically, the first one kind of was in it, mm -hmm. almost like a projectile. And the other one was following it, it was imaging it. So when the first impact came in, they were imaging it with the second spacecraft and sending the data back. Yeah. Wow. In that last part, so they could see, they were trying to figure out how solid the asteroid was. I thought it was mm -hmm. a real safe floaty landing. No, there, 
It was a collision landing. Where they did a soft landing. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, a different mission. Different, different oh, mission. Okay. Yeah. That's so cool, though, that we've mm-hmm. been on asteroids. A, a new. Uh, Good. You're offline. Oh. Did any questions come in? Or? Oh, there's good. Oh, okay. I'll play. Are you going to do telescopes outside now? Or what's I think so. It was really cloudy when we looked outside. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you.